<clears throat> right, so uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank the Society of Antiquities for inviting me to uh, be here tonight and delivering this, uh, this lecture. It's a great pleasure, and thank you, everyone, who uh, came along to see, um, to see me uh, talk, and also everyone at home. Um, so this lecture will <clears throat> largely combine research that I have been doing mostly in the last 10 years uh, and was part of both my PhD and also the work that I did as a researcher for Scotland's Rock Art Project, which I will probably be referring to as SCRAP from now on, um, for short. Um, so first things first, I think that uh, definitions are important, and um, it's important to know what is Atlantic Rock Art, what are we referring to? And I will start by telling you, which many of you will probably already know, um, about Atlantic Rock Art, which is the most common definition of this of this um, carving tradition. So um, again, it is a carving, a prehistoric carving tradition. It is mostly known for the circular motifs, like cup and rings and cup marks, which essentially are little hollows with um, maybe two to four centimeters in diameter, surrounded by rings, um, and other variations such as penannulars and rosettes and wavy grooves. And I will show images of all of these motifs in a minute. These motifs are all um, carved, so we don't have any evidence for paintings at the moment. Um, and they tend to be, they, or they were created, or they tended to be created in flat and horizontal um, boulders and outcrops in the landscape, and often quite flush with, with the ground. So um, this is an open air kind of rock art, so we find it in, in open landscapes. Um, and it was, it, it was also thought that um, th their location was mainly um, to do with landmarks and uh, to take advantage of wide um, views over the landscape. So I became interested in, in Atlantic rock art more than 20 years ago. Um, and the first panel that I studied was called Pneu dos Sinais, or slab of the signs. And this is a large and, uh, and flat outcrop, extensively decorated, as you can see, with circular motifs and cup and rings that is located in the north of Portugal on the eastern slopes of a mountain which is crowned by a large hill fort or oppidum. I think that you would agree that um, this panel displays a classic combination, combination um, or composition of Atlantic rock art, and we probably wouldn't be very surprised to actually find it somewhere here in Scotland as well. And it's this distribution of Atlantic rock art across the Atlantic facade that has always interested me. Um, I find it really intriguing how we have similar motifs in all of these regions, from Britain to Ireland and Iberia, uh, which were probably created in the, same, in the same period. There are some authors who also include Atlantic rock art or say that they, it expands to other places like Scandinavia, but it's a little bit more controversial and I'm leaving it out of the talk uh, for today. So I guess I was interested in finding out whether we were looking at um, a one phenomenon, one single phenomenon, something that was created um, in a unifying manner. How do we know that it is the same, that, that we're looking at the same, at the same tradition? Why did people create it um, and how? Um, and, and, and how could we figure this out? So, so this is what I really was interested in and, and wanted to find out. And just to give you a little bit of context, the sites that I, that I looked at uh, for my PhD, you can see uh, I have five case studies, if you can see the very small kind of red bits in, uh, in uh, Portugal and Spain. Um, and so I, I wanted to study this um, interconnectivity, so this kind of wider distribution, and I thought that it was important to, to try to compare the rock art in these uh, different regions. So I had uh, one case study for each of these regions. And then, um, obviously, all the sites that, that were recorded during, uh, during scrap. And so the talk today uh, will encompass the information from all of these sites and, and, and these two projects, as I mentioned before. So each of the countries that I just mentioned um, have their own research biography in terms of Atlantic rock art. And um, in all of them, this type of rock art has been known or was known since the 19th century, at least. In Scotland, we see the first publications about Atlantic rock art in 1830. 
Um, and they were reporting on the carved rocks around Cairnbarn in Kilmartin in Argyll. And there are a few exceptions, but essentially the first studies were mostly um, concerned about understanding the meaning of the rock art, obviously the chronology, because this was something new that they had never seen before, different from all the other types of archaeological, um, archaeological sites. Um, they wanted to understand the style, the distribution, and this led to the creation of endless typologies and endless descriptions of the rock art that didn't always provide enough explanation about the social context of the rock art. And so this is, um, you know, a bit of a fast forward um, because there's a lot of uh, a lot of research biography that we could be discussing in a bit more detail. But it was only in the 1950s that um, Owen McQuaid, who was an Irish an Irish uh, diplomat and an archaeologist, he completed his PhD in uh, in Madrid. And he was the first person who started to create some connections and, and identify resemblances between the rock art that he knew from Galicia uh, in, northern, in northwest Spain and also in Ireland. And he was the first person who uh, began to discuss possible cultural relationships um, along the Atlantic facade <clears throat> in the Bronze Age. So McQuaid was actually the person who coined the term Atlantic. Uh, to refer to these kinds of carvings, which was then picked up by Richard Bradley, Professor Richard, uh, Richard Bradley in the 80s and in the 90s. Um, and then uh, Bradley carried on looking at this comparison between the, the, the rock art in these regions in a more kind of systematic way. And as you probably know, he wrote extensively about this and has um, <clears throat> work that is still a reference today. And it is because of this geographic scope of the, uh, of, the, um, of, of the term that I like to use it to refer to the rock art because not everyone uses this expression, but for me, it really encompasses the uh, wide distribution of, of, um, of this, this uh, rock art tradition. Now, the problem with making comparisons purely based on style um, is that there are, there are as you can see, many other types of Atlantic rock arts out there in the world. There are many other rock art traditions that are also um, based on circular motifs. And they're probably not the same thing that we're looking at here uh, for, for Britain and, and, or, or you know, the Western Europe. Um, so we can't really consider them to be Atlantic rock art. And so we have to look into more characteristics, we have to look deeper into, into, into this tradition to actually be able to um, create um, or, or compare. Um, also, we know that stylistic similarities are not the same as chronological equivalents, and so we can't really be um, establishing these, uh, these um, comparisons only based on um, what the symbols look like. So it was necessary to uh, look further, and uh, in the 1980s, uh, we see the introduction of landscape archaeology to rock art research. And again, this was largely introduced by uh, Professor Richard Bradley, uh, and also a few, other, a few other researchers who began to be really interested uh, in these features. In fact, in, in, um, in, the, in the literature, uh, we start seeing Ronald Morris, who is actually uh, a British archaeologist, talking about the relationship of the rock art with some uh, geographical features. Um, and, I th and I think that, in a way, Bradley was probably influenced by Morris in his, um, in his approach to the landscape or bringing the landscape more closer to research, uh, rock art research. Um, so Bradley's work was really influential, was influenced by, uh, by social anthropology and also structuralism, and he was interested in exploring this relationship between the rock art and specific uh, landmarks of the territory and drawing social and, and economic con uh, context for, for the rock art. So he thought that, that by looking at the landscape um, characteristics and the relationship of the rock art with the landscape, we could actually um, understand more of its role within uh, past societies and come up with less functionalist interpretations that would incorporate people's uh, perceptions and experiences as they moved through the landscape. Um, so he, he influenced many researchers in the following decades, me included. Um, 
And a lot of the assumptions that he did or that he made for, for Atlantic rock art, um, such as the relationship of the rock art with pathways or these uh, um, uh, the wide visibilities, uh, the, the, the view sheds, were often transposed to other geographical places and to other studies, sometimes without much criticism or la uh, with a lack of attention to um, the, uh, the local context. Either way, by the end of the 21st century, we have a completely different story of Atlantic rock art. Um, and so, while the landscape was really important and brought us a lot of new knowledge and a lot of uh, new ways of thinking about the rock art, the, um, the study of the motifs was practically sidelined. So while in the beginning it was the focus of the research, by the end of the, uh, of the 20th century, um, researchers were moving away from looking at the motifs because it was mostly something that was associated with cultural history and they were more interested in embracing more processualist and post-processualist approaches. My research uh, was then... So I was interested in looking at the landscape as well um, because I think that this connection between the Atlantic rock art and the landscape is completely undeniable. But the more I looked at the rock art in situ, so I visited all of these sites in the, in the different uh, regions that I was studying, the more I looked at it, the more I was sure that we also had to uh, look at or go back to looking at the, uh, at the motifs. And so, um, because they were showing similarities and also differences, and I was interested in establishing comparisons, and so I needed um, a detailed kind of platform to compare my rock art um, against. And so I came up with a multiscalar methodology, which essentially uh, was looking at a small scale based on the motif, so the very small uh, details, how they were done, what kind of carving techniques were being used, what were their shapes, um, in detail, and obviously this, um, this level of detail really benefited from uh, the application of new digital uh, recording and, and 3D modeling techniques um, because they enabled me as, you know, and, and other researchers who use this to look at details that weren't really available maybe 20 years ago, 10, 20 years ago. And so, um, apart from the, uh, the motifs, my medium scale of analysis was looking at um, the rocks that were being selected to be carved and also the compositions and, and how the motifs were um, connected with each other on these rock surfaces and how they were... Um, and so all of, these, all, of these, uh, all of these details of spatial organization and structure. And then I had a large scale of analysis which was essentially looking at um, the wider landscape. And the importance of this methodology is that it moved away from traditional and static approaches um, to, to, to rock art and, and brought together all of these components. So I, I could study them individually, but in the end when I brought them together, it was providing a much uh, more comprehensive picture of the, of the rock art. Um, so I won't really bore you with all the technical details of these, uh, of these analyses. I think that that is something that's a, a different talk. Um, but what I will do is um, tell you some of the, or maybe start weaving the story of Atlantic rock art and tell you uh, what we learned from all of these, um, all of these analyses. A renewed vision for Atlantic rock art, if you'd like. A renewed concept. Um, <clears throat> so we can start with the iconography. You can't really uh, go too far from what we already knew, um, but I built my iconography based on um, the work of Blaise O'Connor, who was working in Ireland. And when I started working on that, I thought that it was amazing that looking at her, um, at her, at uh, so categories of, of of motifs, I could very easily apply them to my other um, case studies in, say, Iberia, you know, and and that to me um, was was saying something. And so um, I came up with these multiple um, categories of of, of motifs. Um, I analyzed 
all of my uh, of my rocks individually and um, actually for Scotland's rock art project uh, Lucy Caloran was working with us and I can tell you that she looked at more than 16,000 individual motifs um, which was pretty amazing um, and what we can conclude is that you know the the, the preferred motifs are definitely the circles um, but there are also others that are less that are less um, common but are still but are still there like the rosettes and um, and um, the penannulars, um, and there were a few surprises as, as we went along. The majority of these motifs were created through pecking, and we all knew that already, but we were also able to find other um, carving techniques such as incisions and, abras and abrasion, and you know, sometimes these techniques were used together uh, or in combination to achieve specific results. Now, the main difference between the rock art of Britain and Iberia is, of course, the presence of figurative imagery, such as the animals and the weapons um, in, uh, in Iberia, which are very common and, and create, were created and, and carved alongside the cup and ring motifs. We also have a few humans and we have uh, these idols. Uh, we have some daggers and some swords, halberds. These are sometimes interpreted as shields, but we don't, we don't really know what they are. Um, and so there's, there's more variation. There's more variation um, of motifs. They all are carved sometimes on the same panels, sometimes on panels alongside each other. Um, the fact is that we don't really understand the relationship between all of these uh, types of, um, of motifs, and uh, which also has implications for the chronology, essentially. And obviously, we thought that we didn't have any animal carvings, at least in Scotland, until very recently. But now we can start thinking about going out and looking for more animal carvings after, obviously, uh, this amazing find uh, by Hamish Fenton that we were very lucky to study uh, in, um, <clears throat> uh, during scrap. So essentially, this is done Craig at Cairn. And, uh, Hamish was able to identify, again through 3D modeling, the depiction of these uh, deer carvings on the underside of, uh, of the capstone. And until then, we didn't know of any uh, animal carvings of this chronology, at least here in Scotland. And even in, in other parts of um, the rest of Britain, it's, it's very um, rare. Anyway, if you're interested, our paper is free to download. So. Uh, go ahead and if you're interested in knowing what we had to say about it. So um, in terms of chronology, the depiction of the weapons in Iberia uh, was actually used to date part of the rock art, was used as a reference to date part of the rock art. So it was, it was assumed that because the cup and rings were sometimes um, carved alongside weapons that they would be from the same kind of chronological period. And obviously some of these motifs are very detailed and we have a material counterparts that are well dated from excavations. Also, there was the find of some carvings in um, British funerary monuments, which led people to think that this rock art was also uh, dated to the Bronze Age. However, we are now um, re-establishing a chronological framework for Atlantic rock art. And the more we look into uh, the new data and finds, and also because there's been a few um, archaeological excavations, we are now able to suggest that Atlantic rock art actually had a Neolithic chronology, at least for its origin, probably in the mid fourth millennium BC, but potential, potentially even earlier in other parts of Atlantic Europe. So we've looked at the motifs. Um, and, uh, and we know that what they are, and we know that we have examples of, of, uh, of panels like Ormeg and Aknabrek in, in Kilmartin, and also uh, Drumtrodden in Dumfries and Galloway that are quite complex. But really, what our, um, what our research into uh, these compositions and the characteristics of these compositions is telling us is that these are really rare. And, and they seem to, to act as like central focal points around, um, around which other kind of smaller carvings were created. But essentially, the majority of Atlantic rock art um, is quite simple. Um, they have, panels often have a small number of motifs 
uh, in one surface with a, a few exceptions. Um, and there's also a low frequency of carved motifs. So we generally have one to two, hardly ever more than five different types of motifs on, on one rock surface. And so it was really monothematic, if you'd like. However, if you look at this table, this is part of the uh, categorization that, that uh, I came up with. And so you have on one side um, the uh, motif categories, but if you look at all the variations that each of those categories can have, you, know, you will find that some of the, um, some, some of the design of these, of these motifs is very subtle. You know, um, and the interesting thing about, about um, so just to give you an example, in that row, you look at the, at the gapped rings, and then you can see all the variations that we have just for that uh, category of, um, of motifs. And really, the interesting thing about, about this is that we find these um, subtle variations in a lot of a lot of, uh, um, of panels, and also co-present in the different regions that we're dealing with. And if people were to just be copying cup and, cup and rings, they didn't have to be creating all of these variations. They didn't have to be. Uh, in fact, you know, if you look at copies of Atlantic, of Atlantic rock art panels, they're often in, replicated as spirals, you know. So um, the fact that we see this rock art um, repeated in such detail suggests that this was intentional and that rock art was actually taught uh, intentionally and replicated in all of these regions. In Scotland, um, you can see on that chart, uh, you can see which are the, uh, the favorite uh, or the, the preferred motifs that were used in our, in, um, in, across the country. And then you can also see on the other list uh, which are the motifs that are preferred in each of the regions that we looked at. And so this is telling us that, for example, um, people in Angus and people in Butte had, a, had this understanding or the knowledge of how to create that one cup and ring with that specific cup mark on the rings, which is, again, it's, it's quite specific. Um, or the gapped and complete rings, for example, that we see repeated in Butte and Dunbartonshire and so on. So this is beginning to um, build this picture of relationships between all of these areas, which is reflected in the rock art and that we then can explore further and add more information from other sites and other types of artifacts that we uh, know of. In the case of Scotland, we're also able to identify clear regional preferences. Um, so in the north of the country, um, the rock art tends to be slightly more simple and based on um, just the creation of cup marks. Um, and to the south, we see obviously Dumfries and Galloway and, and Kilmartin have really complex compositions that are much similar to what we find in places like Iberia, for example. But right at the beginning of the talk, I said that we couldn't really just be comparing the rock art based on the style of the motifs. That was not enough to um, understand the relationship between the rock art, um, or even confirm if we're looking at one, one phenomenon. And so the subtle variation of motifs is a good start, but there are other characteristics that we can look at. And one of the most interesting things about Atlantic rock art is this attention and interplay with, the nat with natural features. This is something that has, had already been pointed out by Andy Jones, uh, who noted how Atlantic art was so reactive to natural features. And in this, um, in this study, uh, and with the level of detail that we were looking at, we could also confirm this. And in fact, we see natural features being used as uh, radials to simulate radials. We see them being used organizing the motifs on the panels. We see them using the edges of the, uh, of the panels as, um, you know, the, the limit of their, of their carvings. And we also see them using certain bumps and lumps of the rock art to create really three-dimensional pictures. And this is particularly interesting because these really three-dimensional motifs um, are quite common here in Scotland. And from what I gathered from my, uh, from my research, the only other place where we actually see this um, in, in its fullest expression is actually in Portugal. 
so because there is this attention to the uh, um, the natural features of the rocks, perhaps selecting a, a, a rock would be a really important step in the creation of Atlantic rock art. Um, perhaps even more than the landscape. Um, and rocks could have been selected based on their geological features, the presence of all of these um, uh, of these elements that would afford the results that they were expecting, um, or even they could be they could have been selected for other reasons that were not really um, that we don't know about, such as the color of the core of the rocks, because as they were carving, obviously, this would create quite a contrast. Um, I find that one quite striking with that orange there. I can only imagine that if it was carved, you know, what you would see would be orange, um, orange carvings. So whichever the reason, we also see preferences in this, uh, in this, in the selection of this type of media. And again, if you look at the map uh, there, if you manage to see the little dots, uh, the red ones are bolder. So we get to see that um, there is, they were using boulders and outcrops across of, across the whole country, but there is a slight pref um, preference for boulders um, up in the north and then outcrops in the south. And this could also have to do with the availability um, of the outcrops or not, or perhaps a preference for erratics if they were different from the local geology, but um, the type of media also indicates, also provides information. So with all of this, does the landscape still matter? Yes, this is the short answer. The landscape still matters because um, Atlantic rock art does have a very kind of tight relationship with the landscape. It was created to be stuck to a place, if you want, fixed to a location. Um, and again, deciding where to carve would also have been uh, something important. And, uh, and certainly part of the message, the location of the rock art would also be part of the message that was trying to be, or they were trying to kind of pass on. And we have seen how Bradley was so effective in demonstrating the importance of this relationship. He thought of the rock art as a language of signs that were expressed as boundary markers and that they would be associated with paths leading through the landscape to certain and specific places along the way. So when we started thinking about what we wanted to know about the landscape location, we had two main objectives. One of them was uh, to look for rock art, for, for patterns that could um, tell us what, uh, more about the rock art. Uh, but the other one was also to confirm or dispel some of the previous assumptions that had been made um, about this relationship between the rock art and the landscape. And so we carried out a number of spatial analyses using, you know, a range of, of, uh, of computational techniques, GIS analysis, spatial statistics. Um, and in, in the case of my PhD, I also carried out um, kind of a sensorial um, analysis to kind of counterbalance all the numbers that I was getting from my, uh, my uh, quantitative analysis. I thought that it would, it would be important to also have this embodied experience. Um, and so these are some of the variables that we looked at in terms of the, uh, of the landscape. There's lots of them. I'm not gonna go through all of them in individually. Um, I'm sure that we may have uh, talked about this before. And so, what is really important to understand is that these variables are in a way very artificial and they may have meant nothing to the people in the past, but they do help us to think about the landscape and how to articulate this relationship um, and to make sense of the carvings because we have to start somewhere. Um, it's also important to note that all the GIS analysis that we have done were based on modern base maps um, and the geomorphology could have been slightly different. And there are cases that are uh, very um, obvious. So for example, we didn't do any sea level modeling, but when we were looking at uh, reconstruction of sea levels from other authors, when we look at 6,000, 5,000, um, 4,000 BP, uh, we, the differences with today can be quite striking. So for example, Tyree and Butte today are two islands at the time were four islands, you know, and specifically in Tyree, we have all of the rock art in only one of those two islands, you know. 
So these are really important things that we have to consider. Also, Kilmartin, all the rock art in Kilmartin was a lot more coastal, and there were a lot more... Um, the navigation would be easier uh, to, some, in, to some places that today we can't really navigate to. Um, so things that we have to think about when we're looking, when we're thinking about the landscape and all these variables. But <clears throat> just to give you um, an idea, um, in Scotland we were able to look at soil types, land use and peat depth to um, investigate the absence of rock art in some specific areas, because this gives us um, some, you know, some, some idea about destruction, about archaeological processes, taphonomical processes, um, that may be involved in the reason why some areas are quite empty of rock art. Um, when we're looking at the landscape setting, the aspect, uh, well, we talked about geology, obviously, we, if, we, if we look at the geological maps, we have a sense of uh, the hardness or the softness of, softness of, of the rock that uh, people were dealing with in specific areas. Um, also, the study of the aspect, which is the orientation of the terrain, uh, the elevation and slope informs us about the choice of the location of the rock art and allow us to consider whether it would be accessible or not, um, how it was viewed, because if it is located in some, you know, in, in certain um, orientations, then we have the implication of the sunlight during the day or during the year that would um, allow people to look at the rock art in different ways, and also the types of activities that were uh, being carried out on the, you know, along the uh, um, the rock art or on the side of the rock art. So uh, we know that there are, we have some some examples of rock art that are located in soils that today are infertile, um, and were perhaps. Um, used for grazing, uh, and others where we know that the soils were um, quite rich. So there is a lot of a variation and a lot of information that we can get out of these, um, of these variables. Um, we also looked at the relationship between the rock art or the spatial relationship between the rock art and um, other archaeological sites. And again, we see some case studies across Scotland which are located in places where we don't have any more information, we don't see any more human activity going on in that period, and others that are buzzing landscapes with lots of activity going on. So by combining all of these elements together, we start to compose a picture of the making and use of Atlantic rock art. One of the surprising conclusions drawn from this study was the fact that individually the carved rocks did not have um, exceptional views over the landscape. Um, and this contrasts the, uh, some, some of the assumptions that had been made previously, um, that the rock art was supposed to command or usually commands extensive vistas. Um, so, Visibility and intervisibility very much depends on the topography and the microtopography, uh, but there are other things that we also have to consider. So even if we have extensive vistas from one or, or visibilities from one site, it doesn't mean that we can accurately see 50 kilometers away. You know, so we have to think about these things critically. Also, there are other things that influence the way that we see the rock art. Even if it is located in the open landscape, Atlantic rock art is often carved in small to medium-sized boulders or, or outcrops that are not necessarily visible in the landscape. Also, they're flushed with the ground. They're probably covered seasonally um, by vegetation. The, uh, the, the grooves were, uh, tend to weather in a very short period of time, so they would become almost invisible in a very short period unless people would be going there um, to carve them. So there's a lot to consider um, about visibility. And also, we have to consider atm atmospheric conditions um, because we don't have very sunny weather all the time. And, you know, the fog and the grey skies they all have uh, a, an implication in the way that we see um, and perceive the rock art. And also I thought that when we were doing fieldwork in Ireland, um, which is that picture on the, uh, on the, on the, uh, the corner there, um, I thought that the sound of the water, we had a stream 
right next to us, and the sound of the water was really, really striking. And I thought that um, this was also a way of kind of hiding any pecking or anything that was going on there, because we couldn't even talk to each other. We couldn't really um, hear anything. So anyway, is it a public or is it a private art? It is located in the open landscape, but it seems to me that is pretty private. And it's also interesting to consider these issues of public and private display in relation to the idea that rock art may have been associated um, with pathways of mobility. Um, and so during Scrap, we did some, um, we did some mobility analysis combining um, least cost path and agent-based modeling to simulate patterns, which you can see in that picture. Um, and the green patterns that you see um, are just, are not the preferred ones. So um, we have, we can't, you can't really see the red ones, but there are red lines there, they're yellow and they're the green ones, and the red lines are the ones that would have been traversed more commonly. They would be the preferred uh, paths that people would be um, using across the landscape. And what this told us was that, so we did the modeling in relation to the rock art, and this showed us that in Kilmartin, uh, and effectively in most of the other case studies across Scotland, the rock art is not related to any of the modelled um, pathways. In fact, it seems to be repelled by it. Um, and we also looked at, which is interesting in itself because it kind of contradicts, again, this idea that rock art may have been associated with pathways in the past. And we also did this for, uh, standing, uh, for standing stones, which seem to be closer to, to pathways, um, and there is a more strict relationship there, and also funerary monuments, and the funerary monuments were definitely on the pathways. It's almost as if they were created in places where they were supposed to be found. And so, combining all of these results together, the small, the medium, and the large-scale analysis, what we have is this idea that Atlantic rock art was indeed a wide phenomenon. Um, and it was probably widespread across the Atlantic facade through networks of exchange and cultural transmission that we see existed um, and that we kind of can trace through um, other types of artifacts and other types of monuments and other types of, of things that appear in the archaeological record that are present in all of these regions simultaneously. So the concept of Atlantic rock art seemed to have traveled with these objects, with these people, with these animals, um, and it was repeated in the different regions. This was a tradition that was understood by different communities that were living in faraway regions, but who somehow shared some level of beliefs and considered the rock art important enough to extensively recreate it on their landscapes. Now, how people used it, what it meant, we don't have answers for this. But what we can see is that Atlantic rock art was created in a time where there was lots of transformations happening. Um, so we have uh, the introduction of a new range of monuments like the curses and the chamber tombs, but also practices and traditions and beliefs. Uh, and some researchers even believe that, you know, some of these changes happened in Britain due to contacts and, and um, people coming from, um, from the continent or contacts with the continent which ADNA seems to be um, corroborating. Um, and it is in this context of change that we see um, Atlantic rock art being created. In Scotland, we see it in contexts that are seemingly removed, removed from daily lives, as I mentioned, and... Um, other, like in, in Port of Menteith, for example, in Stirling, Stirlingshire, and we also see um, other areas uh, like our case study of Cairn Holy in Dumfries and Galloway, where rock art is very much uh, imbued in a very kind of lived uh, um, context. So there is a mix of situations where the rock art is happening, and we have seen throughout this talk that all of the variables, all of the attributes that we discussed have a lot of variations in all the regions. And essentially, um, this reflects the whole nature of the Neolithic period itself, um, where we see a shift from hunter, fisher, gatherer subsistence to an economy which is more reliant on livestock and cereal cultivation, and also the introduction of, um, of technological and social novelties that reached people 
at different times. So they, it, it has different rhythms and results in different societies. And, uh, and so these differences are also uh, reflected in the rock art and in the regional variations and preferences that we see. In the wider context, how does rock art fit with the wider narrative of European prehistory? Well, we have an element of transformation. This tradition sits comfortably in this idea of, uh, of, of the transformative character of Neolithic, where we see people transforming the landscape and creating these really large monuments, um, even if expressed in the, the smaller scale of of a panel, of a rock panel, but transforming something natural and hard would probably be significant or a significant act of appropriation of a natural element. Um, we also have this element of hiding that we've, been, that we've been talking about, and we see this hiding element in other contexts in the Neolithic as well. We have some authors believe that um, in Newgrange there were specific carvings, specific um, decorated um, rocks that were concealed, they are hiding in there, they're difficult to reach. We also have, in, uh, in the Ness of Brodgar, we have carved um, blocks being hidden within the structures, within the, the, the houses. And so, we also see this idea, this concept of concealment with, with Atlantic art, um, you know, with the creation of, of the motifs and small stones um, and so on, all this idea that we've discussed previously about private and public. And we also have this, uh, this rock art changing with the societies, changing with um, not only physically but also socially. So Atlantic rock art um, in the beginning was part of a society for whom stone was really important. And towards the end, we see the introduction of metalwork, for example, and this may have changed the way that people perceived it. Um, and this is very much also present in, um, in the archaeological record. But just to, just to show you that in the third millennium, there is something something definitely happened because we start seeing the rock art being introduced in funerary monuments, right? So we moved from having the rock art in, open, in the open landscape and it is now being placed in secluded, dark, confined funerary spaces. Um, and we don't really understand why this happened, but it is possible that I kind of had a quick look at like 57 monuments that have carved blocks in of cup marks and cup and rings. And there is, again, there is a huge variety um, of monuments, both Neolithic and Bronze Age, um, that have these, uh, these monuments introduced generally in this period of the early Bronze Age, which is also known for its interest in the ancestors and the reuse of Neolithic, um, of, of Neolithic monuments. Um, and there are also examples of, of some of these burials that have, they seem to have been curated in a way. You have an early Bronze Age burial with a deposition of a Neolithic carved rock, Neolithic pottery. So there really seems to be this interest in the past. Um, and so, and this extends to the rock art as well. And what all of these uh, monuments have in common, as far as I could tell, is the presence not only of the carvings, but also um, beakers. We have beaker pottery in most of them, or food vessels, which are often um, also associated with plano convex knives. Um, and this is what they all have in common. Now, what this suggests is that something was happening at the time that created this, um, changed the perception in the way that people relate, uh, thought about the rock art and, and related to it and used it. And what we can see more widely, obviously this could have been something that came from, from the indigenous populations, but what we see more widely, um, it's really an increase in migration uh, and in larger numbers than we ever thought. Right? And I put the, um, the Amesbury Archer here because the Amesbury Archer is a great embodiment of what was going on in this period. You know, he, uh, he was buried with 
a lot of the artifacts and a lot of the novelties that were being introduced in the in this country. So he has, um, you know, he has all the uh, the lithic the lithic materials. He has the beaker potteries. Um, he has the whole package apart from the rock art, which I really wish he had. <laughs> that would have been good. Um, and obviously, he has the genetics coming from the continent, so showing that people were effectively coming in. So really, uh, it is possible that this change in the society also brought change into the rock art. Now, this is here only to show you one of the last examples, um, or, or actually, this is one of the only examples that I know of of a carved of, of a Neolithic carving in a context that was found in an excavation in this Middle Bronze Age um, hut, and uh, and this is really just to, just to say that we don't really see. Atlantic rock art being used for its for itself, you know, for 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 what it was, for what it is um, beyond uh, the Middle Bronze Age. This is a residual use of of a carved block, and we also see it in Bros, and we also see it in um, in souterrains. But they probably weren't using it for Atlantic rock art for what it is or had a completely complete different understanding. It's a, it, let's say that it's not a symbolic reuse of, of the rock art. So just to finish, um, I just wanted to bring these really amazing illustrations by Alan Braby because they serve the double purpose, um, a double purpose in this talk. On one hand, they are illustrating, uh, in a way that I could not, people uh, interacting with the cup and rings. On the left side, we have a woman and a man um, carrying out their daily activities alongside the carvings of Atlantic art uh, on, on an outcrop. And really, the rock art, the, perhaps that's what it was. It was related to daily activities, to their, their, their lives, their daily lives. And on the right-hand side, th it's a possible interpretation of, of the cup and rings as somehow associated with death and funerary rites, which could also be possible. Um, and this reminds us that although the rock art was primarily created on open landscapes, it could have served a purpose of, of a funerary purpose that we cannot see when it's on, on the landscape, but becomes more clear when they then move it into, um, into the, uh, the, uh, the funerary settings. But really, the black and white nature of these drawings in many ways illustrate our perception of prehistory, colorless, without all the details that we need to fully understand the use and the reuse of Atlantic rock art as it changed over time and the social transformations underlying these changes. Um, and so it's just, uh, just for us to be aware of, uh, of all the limitations um, of our interpretations. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>